Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be back in Saginaw. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Tim Dempsey. I'm a vice president with Public Sector Consultants. I actually worked for the city of Saginaw back in the early 2000s. And the city means a lot to me and my family. Both my children, who are now 19 and 21, were born here in the city. And their early years were, were here in Saginaw. So, it's a special community, both working here, living here, and raising a young family. So it's great to be back with all of you. And I look forward to working with the city council uh, this morning to understand and sort through and navigate the American Rescue Plan and funding. A little bit of a background on public sector consultants for those of you who are not familiar with us. We are a women-owned small business focusing on public policy research. We are a nonpartisan objective third-party firm that comes in and helps organizations answer difficult questions, sort through strategies, and try to develop answers to difficult and challenging problems. We're based in Lansing, Michigan. We've been in business since the late 1970s and have worked with local governments. We have worked with state agencies, nonprofits, business associations, a wide range of companies. Our solutions focus again on strategy facilitation, which is what we'll be doing here today, is helping the council facilitate through this process, but also research, implementation, and evaluation. We're going to have a presentation by Dr. Scorsoni from Michigan State University. He's going to give an overview of the American Rescue Plan Act. So. Well, good morning. Thank you, Tim. Um, it's good to be here. It's good to be here in person on Zoom, finally. Um, so I'm born and raised in Saginaw, most of my family's still here. And so this is an important place to me, I still consider it home. This is an incredible opportunity for all the communities in Michigan, but obviously today we're gonna to talk specifically about Saginaw's opportunities. This is the biggest federal investment in local government since the 1970s in the general revenue sharing program. So it's whether we'll ever see this again, whether this will continue in some form, we don't know, but this is an incredible opportunity over the next few years for Saginaw. So we'll talk a little bit about the law, what we know. I want to emphasize that we have only interim rules. We do not have final rules from the U.S. Department of Treasury. So will we see major changes? I don't know. Everyone I've talked to in Washington says there have been a lot of comments that, of things people want to see change in these rules. but. Quite frankly, there's been a lot of silence out of Washington on this as well. So, quite frankly, you just don't know. So you do need to proceed with a little caution in terms of how you move forward. So the American Rescue Plan Act passed in the spring of 2021 under the Biden administration. It modified the Social Security Act and basically allocated uh, under this thing called the Local Coronavirus Recovery Fund $150 billion to local governments across the country. And there's about 80,000 local governments in the United States. It targeted counties and metropolitan cities like Saginaw or Detroit or Flint, uh, what are called entitlement units. So you get money directly from the U.S. Treasury. Everybody else who's basically smaller gets money through the Michigan Department of Treasury. This is obviously part of a much bigger plan. This, this whole plan is over $2 trillion, so this is only one part of it. I want to be clear, what are the goals and non-goals of this legislation? Because this is important as you think about what it can and cannot do for you. The basic goal of ARPA, as we call it, was to stimulate the economy. And you can say, well, the economy seems to be doing pretty well. Yes, in some ways it is, but actually, Recent data indicates that maybe it's not as good as we thought, so, uh, but regardless, this was an economic stimulus plan. And that's important context. It was not a plan, despite the name of the fund, to actually fix local government's financial problems, for example. Like a lot of communities in Michigan, I'm chair of the Municipal Stability Board in Lansing, which is a regulator of local pensions. And those pension problems are still going to be there. They're not going to be fixed by this law, for example. This law isn't going to fix the local property tax system or anything like that. I mean, there's a whole series of issues around municipal finance in Michigan uh, that we're not going to talk about today, but this law isn't going to fix all that stuff that most of you as local officials probably are aware of. 
What it is designed to do is help stimulate the local economy uh, through investments and through uh, and critically one-time infusions. You know, how you use money, given it's one-time money, means you have to think differently than if this was ongoing investment every year or every couple of years. Um, it can't be used, for example, for direct payments into your pension system. It cannot be used to lower taxes. It cannot be used to pay off debt or even other obligations. There are some, we're not going to get into all the nuances, there are some places where you could do some of that, but for the most part, those are off limits. And those are the kind of things if you were going to fix municipal budgets, you probably would be doing. So that's important to understand. This is not going to fix financial problems, per se, of cities. Some cities may still have serious financial problems despite getting millions of dollars from the federal government. And so that's an important distinction for you to understand right now. Um, now, the last one maybe is critical, that maybe this will help stimulate the economy, which then will direct more revenues to the city, but that could take many years. So again, it's not going to maybe help in the media. We, um, first of all, you're going to have to justify the money's usage, especially as an entitlement community. There's going to be a lot of scrutiny. So it's absolutely critical, document, document, document. You must document why you're doing things, what's your justification. It doesn't mean, there are some local officials who I think are a little afraid of this money, quite frankly. They don't like the idea, because most federal programs are reimbursement based. You spend money and then you get reimbursed. This is different, right? You're getting the money up front, um, and then you're spending it, and then hopefully you're doing the things the feds think are justifiable. So some local officials get a little nervous, like what happens if I mess up and I have to repay it? I mean, that is theoretically a possibility, but I think not, not real likely, as long as you do the work and justify and document. So that's just something to think about. Um, don't use one-time money for ongoing expenses. This is a basic principle of finance. We, this is one-time money. Maybe, you know, I think Congressman Kildee has talked about trying to do something longer term. But obviously that is not passed Congress or anything. So at this point, it is just one-time money, meaning you don't build new programs with new expenses that are ongoing for salaries or whatever on one-time money, OK? Um, if you want to pay for salaries on a temporary basis, that's fine, as long as you recognize in the next year that money's not going to be there. So it's really critical as you build programs, you don't build in ongoing expenses unless you have a way to pay for it. Because unlike the federal government, local governments don't just get to issue debt uh, or use the Federal Reserve and those kinds of things. So that is a critical issue. Um, and again, as I said, it can't be used to just cut taxes or pay off pensions, uh, those kind of things, which are often the kind of problems a lot of local governments have. Or even building reserves. You can't just plug it into your fund balance or you know, that's your kind of rainy day fund. You know, it might go there temporarily uh, until you spend it, but it can't be there permanently. And they will be looking at this. They've already said very clearly that the Inspector General of the U.S. Treasury is going to be looking at stuff. And they're going to be examining, especially bigger communities like a Saginaw or Detroit, they're going to be looking for these things and seeing if that's what's happening. What can it be used for? And I think there's four pots uh, to way I'm going to kind of go through each one quickly. Assist with negative economic impact on the community. That's the biggest one, right? We know that our communities have been impacted by COVID and by the economic crisis. Households, yes, households got stimulus payments, but those are pretty much gone now. Households got rental assistance, but a lot of that's trickling down. Um, and they're still facing these problems, whether it's addictions, whether it's homelessness, whether it's joblessness or underemployment. There are a lot of problems in our community stuff. So the money, one of the primary uses is helping address those kind of issues. And that is different because city governments, you know, county government tends to be more of a social welfare program. City governments are, you know, we tend to be police and fire and water and sewer and those kind of things in Michigan. So this is a really different opportunity where the city government has a chance to really get involved in these kind of programs on a much bigger scale than I would say ever before. You know, really the only exception would be the city of Detroit, which has programs that are much bigger because of its size. 
Hot two is revenue loss. Now, we this is going to be tricky. I'm going to go through this. There's, you know, we lost revenue due to the pandemic. Therefore, we can recoup some of that. But again, that's still only one-time money. So again, you got to be careful how you're going to use that. Hot three, water, sewer, and broadband. Most importantly, roads are not here. Why? Because we have an infrastructure bill for roads. And cities, you know, one of their primary responsibilities is roads. But again, roads are not in here. Why broadband? Because, of course, you know, this pandemic has made it clear we need digital access to, to be, you know, in economic development, in job creation. So, you know, broadband is there. I will be honest, the broadband piece is very complicated. And there's a lot of things going on in the state around broadband, so it's critical to tie into those other programs. Uh, water sewer is pretty straightforward, um, but I think we've learned in the pandemic how critical it is to have access to drinking water uh, to be able to do hygiene you know, in this kind of public health crisis. Pot four is um, basic premium hazard pay for essential workers. Not just government workers, actually. This is interesting. It's, if the government uses third-party contractors, uh, say, for garbage collection, that money could actually be used to help for essential pay for garbage collection. Because obviously, uh, a lot of those services are quite difficult during this pandemic period. So it's not just government employees, it could be others um, as well. Um, you can use the money directly. So that's the kind of what you can use it for, but what about how? You can use it for directly, so if you as government providing the service directly or the infrastructure, but also you can give the money to another entity, which is called a subrecipient. Now you're still going to be on the hook for the money and the accountability of the money. And obviously, anytime you enter, you know, you've probably done some of this. When you enter into these relationships, you got a little more complexity of managing the contracts and all that kind of stuff. But but again, that is a possibility, giving it to a nonprofit. Maybe you want to give it to the school district because they need uh, access, although they are giving their own money. Um, maybe you need to give it to whatever, any other kind of entity. Um, you can actually give grants out to households or even businesses. Now again, you're going to have to make sure you're meeting all the federal rules around that kind of thing. Um, and there's quite a few, we don't even have time to go through them right now. but. But, you know, I don't mean that to scare you away from those kind of things, just to be aware that those are things you're going to have to do. And also working with other governments. I didn't get a chance to calculate that Saginaw County is probably getting several hundred million dollars in this money, right? So I know that in Michigan, we don't always like to work together as local governments. There's a lot of turf and so forth. Um, and and I'm, you know, I'm an advisor to the mayor in Flint, and, and I know very well how the county and city, who are right across the street from each other, often don't work together very well. But in this case, you know, I'll just use Flint as an example. Flint, the city of Flint has 100 million. The county has 80 million. Um, and then even the townships around the city have 20 million, 30 million. We need to work together, even if it's on one project. This is a critical opportunity for our state we, we are, you know, as a state, we're, we're kind of struggling. I mean, we're not in the top tier states for economic growth. You know, our population has basically been stagnant for 30, 40 years. Um, and so these are things we need to think about. How do we work together? As, as difficult as it is in Michigan, and there's just a long history of why that is, it is something to consider. So again, that's another opportunity. So part one, we can give aid to impacted industries. I mean, the obvious ones would be things like tourism or any retail business where they had to shut down for a while, uh, restaurants for sure. You know, I mean, obviously for a city like Saginaw, you know, we've got some restaurants here now, so how do we keep those restaurants going when they're facing this sort of ongoing, you know, public health crisis that seems to kind of come in waves? Um, you just have to answer two questions. Was the economic harm? there and was the harm caused by the pandemic. I mean, that's not that hard to prove, quite frankly, but you need to do it. You need to do the homework. You need to do the documentation. Okay, and you can probably do that. And actually, at, at Michigan State, we have a Center for Economic Analysis that's right next to the center I run, who is very good at doing this kind of economic impact studies, um, for example, to help people figure out what is that impact. You know, it's a million dollar impact on Saginaw restaurants. So we can give a million dollars 
to restaurants here with certain provisions of how they could use that money. You need to change your facilities or whatever it is to help make sure you know that kind of stuff. Uh, it has to be reasonable and proportional to the harm. So if there was a million dollar harm to the restaurant industry, you can't give the industry $10 million. Right? That would be disproportionate to the impact. So again, if you don't want the feds in here trying to ask questions, you need to make sure we have a reasonable rate. And, and this is why I would say, you know, if you want to use U of M, that's fine. But, uh, you know, but Michigan State can do this kind of thing, for example, um, and say it was a million dollar impact, and so we believe that's a proportionate response. The feds want to see other entities helping you get, get the information, the evidence, of what you're going to do. That's all I'm saying, because it's important for them to see that documentation, so when they're sitting in that office in D.C., they're like, okay, so I did the work and they showed why, why it's important, you know. Um, aid underemployed or unemployed. So not just unemployed, but underemployed. There's a lot of that right now. People are getting jobs in some cases, but maybe it's at lower pay or something. Food assistance, rental mortgage assistance, eviction and homelessness. As eviction moratoriums are ending, um, this is going to become a big issue again. Um, uh, internet access. People need internet access. We shouldn't assume everybody has uh, excellent internet access necessarily. Educational assistance, retraining programs. Um, relief programs. Uh, it's, you can use the money to help the city build some infrastructure and data so we can do our job better. I mean, this is one of my frustrations, for example, in Flint, is trying to figure out how many people are facing eviction. Do we have any data we can use to to understand the scale of the problem. Uh, can we move legal services to see how much they're referring or to the Genesee County Action Authority, which is running these programs? How do we work with our partners to get good data so we know what the problems are and we have good evidence for what's going on? Small business loans and grants, for example, to help small businesses thrive. Um, even assistance with business planning, new businesses. How do we help new businesses start? Uh, coming out of this pandemic, we're going to have a different kind of economy uh, going forward from this. This is definitely kind of a turning point in what our economy looks like post-pandemic, whatever that is. Um, also, qualified census tracts are very good. Certainly Saginaw has those um, because if you spend money in, in QCFs, it's almost automatically presumed eligible. So it's good, not saying you have to do only in QCFs, but if you can spend the money in QCFs, um, and those are basic areas of sort of high poverty or lower income and other characteristics, um, that's presumed eligible. So that kind of reduces your paperwork. Um, as I said, you can even do things like housing vouchers, residential counseling, housing navigation. You, you could tie it into health care and health care navigation. I mean, there's all kinds of really important creative ideas here. And they do emphasize that when they give examples in the law, um, it's not exhaustive. So it doesn't mean that they're saying you can only do this stuff. You can certainly do other things um, that are laws that are pandemic related. Uh, early, early learning centers, uh, evidence-based educational programs, maybe after school programs if you want to address youth violence, which is a big issue around the state. Uh, those kind of things. Child care. The child care industry is in total chaos in this state and nationally. Um, providers have shut down. Uh, I know I have friends of mine where they're telling me, you know, uh, my kids are older, thankfully, but, you know, basically you have child care three out of four weeks of a month, and that other week you're just not going to get it, but you still got to pay for it. Um, and so there's all kinds of things happening in the child care industry. And obviously, for parents who want to get back to work, that's going to be a big barrier. So how do we help that sector? Um, assistance to families with children. So those are there are a lot of things you can do in terms of how this pandemic has impacted the community. I'm sure you've all had personal experience or friends. You, know, and you can see where the changes are happening. So revenue loss. Second thing they're saying is you lost revenue as local government. So some of this money can go to help you restore that lost revenue. Again, keeping in mind it's only one-time money. Um, and I, this is a pretty complicated calculation. I'm not really going to go through it in detail. But basically what you're doing is saying, you look at your revenues over the last few years, um, 
And then basically you say, what should it have grown at, which is basically 4%. Uh, whether it did or didn't is irrelevant. They're just using this 4% number, which actually for a lot of Michigan cities is probably better than we did actually get, it, uh, in, even if things were okay. Um, and then you kind of decide, okay, what's the gap there between what we actually got and what this sort of calculation is? That's your revenue loss. And so it could be millions of dollars. Now, the really interesting question, I mean, this calculation, you know, I'm sure Tim can help figure out how to do that or or your finance director, um, what can you use the money for? You plug it into your general fund, okay, that's what a lot of governments are doing, but the question is, you can use it for health services, environmental remediation, probably most importantly for Saginaw, fire, police, and public safety, um, and that kind of stuff. But again, this is one-time money, so if, if in two or three years, you know, whatever it is, that's it then. Now you got to figure out what is it. You almost have to decide what is our base budget and then what is our budget with this federal money so that we're making sure we're not spending money that's one time. Because again, you can't use it for debt, pensions. I, you can use this for pensions only in the sense of if I pay a cop X amount and part of that is pension, then I can, I can do that. What I can't do is take a million dollars and just put it in my pension. So there is, it can sort of go into the pension indirectly, but, but that's probably not going to fix it if you have a big unfunded liability. Infrastructure, water and sewer, they're, they're, they're emphasizing speed, so most of this is tied to existing programs. So for in this case, the revolving fund programs at the state. So basically programs that qualify under that, they qualify for this. Because again, they want this money out there. They don't want the government sitting on this money. They want you spending the money to stimulate the economy. So you can do things like anything, it's pretty broad basically, like you need to fix water lines, put in new water lines, do cyber security, uh, green infrastructure, um, whatever, uh, replace lead lines. I mean basically the kind of a lot of stuff we're probably doing anyway. So that, and this is more one-time stuff, right, because generally this is going to be one-time spending. So this is probably a good use of the money for whatever extent we need it. Uh, is water and sewer in particular. Um, climate change, you know, is very real, so we should think about it we think we can address there. Finally, pot four is premium pay. So I can tell you from personal experience, I mean, I started working at Flint in November of 2019 when the pandemic hit. It was absolute chaos. Um, I mean, trying to run government, it was, the first six months was very difficult, and I'm sure it was here as well. Um, workers had been under tremendous stress. Um, you can't just shut down government because the pandemic's here, right? Running a water and sewer system means somebody's there all the time, period. Uh, if they don't, if they're not there, things start breaking and, and not running the good water and bad water in your houses. Don't, don't go away the way you want them to. So um, police and fire can't do their jobs from a computer in their home, right? So government work is inherently about getting out there in the public and doing stuff. So workers, uh, premium pay, there are a lot of rules and I'm not gonna go through them, but I think there is justification in some cases. Already a lot of communities have given premium pay, but obviously with the Delta variant of COVID, we're not, this is not over. It may be going through well through the winter. I mean, there's every expectation that this winter could be very challenging. Um, and so premium pay is available. Also, as I said, for third-party contractors, if you contract with somebody, you know, I mean, garbage collection has been really hit hard by this pandemic. Um, you know, in terms of that's a service that's been challenging to do. Um, so that's an example. Of course, there's reporting requirements. This is the federal government. They don't give money without strings, um, especially if you're over 50,000, which I know Saginaw is, uh, you know, well, maybe not quite there, but still an entitlement unit. Um, you're going to have quarterly reports, annual reports. You're going to have to tell them what you're using the money for. Uh, projects, bigger projects, bigger contracts have to be specified, you know, individually. Um, part of this is is because they're going to go to Congress and say, this is what we're doing with the money. That's why they do a lot of this, because then they go to congressional committees and say, here's what the money's being used for, or Congressman Kildee, here's what's going on in your area, or whatever. 
are. So that's the kind of thing that goes on and why they do this. Um, and and they haven't even put out all their templates for what they're going to be requiring. So finally, I'm going to have some examples. So Norwich, Connecticut um, uh, is doing, for example, they're finalizing a master plan for a heritage site uh, impacted by COVID, half a million dollars there. Um, a water main extension for 800K. A lot of it going to human services, for job assistance, mental health programs, which is certainly an area we're underfunded as a state. Rental assistance. Uh, community development. They're looking at vacant space redevelopment programs and business improvement grants. So we, I, we have tons of examples. I'm just going to give a couple quickly here. But these are some examples of what's going on already around the country. Akron, Ohio, closer to home here. They actually got quite a lot of money. They don't have a ton of detail yet, but you can see the categories. Housing rehabilitation. I mean, that's a big one. Helping people you know, rehabilitate their homes, get that investment in their homes, because we know for a community like this, that's a really critical thing that can help stabilize the community. Um, public utility support. Um, people are having trouble paying their bills, right? And so, can we get them assistance for drinking water? You know, drinking water affordability is a major problem in Michigan, and it is actually an increasing problem. But how to make sure people can afford drinking water? Um, community and youth violence programs. I'm sure that's on the list here as well. Uh, even city facilities in IT. I mean, I know at least in Flint, and I know I talked in some other cities, like their IT systems were not built for everyone all of a sudden going home and working. And so like having that IT infrastructure investment so that if these kind of things happen again, are we ready? Are we hardened? Do we have cybersecurity? Because that's another problem. Uh, when everybody starts going remote, how are we accessing systems? And does that expose us to cybersecurity problems? You know, those are investments you can start making now, because we all know IT projects cost millions usually, and, um, and you know, and so these are times when you can start making those pretty good investments. Providence, Rhode Island, youth programs, summer camp, they're doing summer jobs programs, night basketball, 600K. Broadband access, again, that's a critical one. Um, over a million dollars. Or anti-violence, mentoring. Uh, not only summer jobs, but year-round jobs for youth. So now we're seeing investments and things like that. I don't have all the details, but you can, we can help you look at what some of the communities are doing if you want. Park redevelopment. Grants to nonprofits, especially homelessness programs, those are often run by nonprofits, so you can absolutely give the money to a nonprofit. You know, you just have to follow some rules. And small business relief, again, helping those small businesses, you know, get through this pandemic when they've lost foot traffic, when they're struggling. Um, you know, we, we actually track, because we work with the city of Detroit, they have very sophisticated data systems on foot traffic downtown Detroit. And I can tell you, while things have rebounded, they're not nearly where they were two years ago when Detroit was really on the rebound. So foot traffic in downtown Detroit is still down 25%. So for a lot of those retailers, they're struggling to survive because they're, the online is not going to replace that foot traffic, uh, certainly not entirely. So that's an example where businesses are really still struggling. People are not out there at the same level they were before. So that's all I have. Um, I, I guess if the council has any quick questions, I'm happy to answer them. But I'm. Certainly, uh, I'll continue to work here, uh, work with Tim and Tim, and uh, help you out as needed. But appreciate your time, and hopefully, this was helpful too. Thank you for that. Um, for me, I just wanted a couple of clarifications when we were talking about the water. Um, for the water, as you said, we can set for these dollars, we can set up a program to support, to help pay, but we will not be able to go back to what we lost and put that money towards that loss. So the revenue loss piece is specifically targeted to like the tax part of the budget only. It is not, so Flint, for example, I know the numbers off the top of my head, we have essentially in the last 15 months lost $15 million of water revenue to the pandemic. Um, you know, I mean, there are bills owed to us still, but, uh, but we can't, that money is not included in this revenue loss calculation. Now, that's, the final rules may change, because we did put in comments to the federal government about 
expanding that definition. We talked to the mayor's conference and actually the cities and others to say, we think this should include water revenues. Because for Michigan at least, other states are different, but in Michigan that's for a big issue for a lot of cities, right? So we may see that change there. So I do I do think you need to take your time in making decisions about not, you know, you've got X amount of dollars right now in the bank, you're gonna get more next year. I mean, you might want to wait and see how the rules evolve because I do think the other thing I would say is in ARPA, not in this program, but in a different program, there's a thing called the Low Income Drinking Water Affordability Program, which may help as well. So there's other pots of money besides this local government piece. But I would say that is a huge issue. I mean, Flint people owe forty million dollars in water bills. Uh, that is a huge challenge for us. I mean, how are we going to sustain the water system? And our collection rate's only 80%. So, I mean, that's an example. I'm sure Saginaw has some of the same issues. Um, so, this probably won't fix all those pieces, but it can help with some of the, at least, current issues. Right? So, yeah. Good morning. Thank you so very much for your presentation. I have a couple of quick questions. I don't think quick questions. Sure. <laughs> but uh, one of my questions would be, um, when you go back to the potential uh, responses um, and it says small business loans and grants yeah. and if I'm not mistaken a grant is to be repaid no loan is to be repaid the loan is to be repaid so when they repay that where does those dollars go to who benefits from that money being given to a business and then that business have to pay it so probably you would want to set up a revolving loan fund of some kind. I mean, probably you may have something like that now. A lot of cities do through CDBG or something where when it's repaid, it goes into a pot and then you can loan it out again. So uh, I don't, you know, they haven't given total rules on all that, but my presumption is they're generally following the rules that already exist in most cases. So I would say that's probably what you would do is say, you pay us back at a very low interest rate, and then we'll use that money again in the future. Okay, because I'm kind of like, with the Auburn Fund, it has to be used in X amount of years, right. so wouldn't this still be Auburn Fund? I mean, yeah, it's a good question whether they're, um, may, you know, maybe, I mean, even though the rules do say loans, I mean, they haven't specified, you're right, you have to expend the money. Now, if I give you paid a loan, is that still ARPA money, or? I don't know. I mean, with grants, it wouldn't be an issue. Um, you know, obviously, with a grant, you're going to need a grant program or, or rules about who gets grants, and you got to administer that, so that's not always easy. But yeah, you're right. I mean, probably in that case, I would definitely recommend waiting for final rules to be issued by U.S. Treasury because just to make sure we're not going to have any issues. Okay. Then my, my next question is, um, you kind of touched on it. Um, so I was wondering uh, two things. How would you propose uh, the possibility of working with other uh, government entities like, you know, inside the county, different other entities bringing us together? I mean, like, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, or do yeah. you have? Yeah. I don't know if I have any silver bullets, but I would say, first of all, if you know county commissioners, I'm sure you do, first thing is just talk to them. Say, look. We all know we're getting this money, we've already gotten money. You know, what are you thinking about? And I'll give you an example from Flint. Like there, for example, we have a we and I'm sure it's true in Saginaw. I mean, my dad was a judge here for a long time. You have a problem where the courts were shut down, there were no jury trials, there were no, you know, so now all of a sudden you got the criminal issues out there and you got the courts backlog in a huge way, which is a county function, but for the city and the police, that's a problem, right? And then you got issues with jails and what's going on with jails. And so, in, and I would say that's a clear example of the city and county need to work together to say, how are we gonna address this problem across our entire criminal justice system? So it may be better to focus on something specific like that and say, you know, how do we work together? Um, and, and again, I know it can be challenging. I would just honestly say, reach out to the people you know right now in the county, share, I don't know, whoever it is, and talk to them and say, look, we need to work together. Because we all serve the same people ultimately, right? So we need, we shouldn't be sort of fighting and dividing money and nobody's paying attention. 
As far as the other town, like Saginaw Township or whatever, I don't know for sure, but I would say again, I mean, the townships have a lot, sometimes a lot of the same issues, right? So, I mean, um, we, we should be thinking about what can we learn, even if it's just learning from each other, having a conversation. I mean, I, I know, um, again, Michigan local governments tend to be very isolated in some ways, but I would recommend pushing on those conversations as much as you can. I, 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 would, I would add that uh, the county administrator and I have talked about doing joint projects and nothing specific. He actually emailed me this week and we're going to have another conversation next week. The mayor and I have already met with the school, uh, the superintendent and the, 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 the chair of the school board and the uh, county as well. So I think we're, we're already on that path. Of, once the council does the work and identifies different categories, like Dr. Spurson said, I think that will um, give us some additional direction. But we also, I think, have to wait for the other entities to go through that process as well. And most of us, I uh, think, in Saginaw County um, do a good job of communicating. I talked with the Saginaw Township uh, manager as well about some things that they're doing. And we did get, several people probably remember, uh, under Governor Snyder, we did have to, we had dinner local government requirements uh, for our revenue sharing. So it, it isn't necessarily new to us, but um, they're, given the influx of money, there's probably a better opportunity to make things happen at this time. Right. I mean, the key is everybody has money. Like the problem, as usual, and not surprising, Tim is on the ball here, but. Um, but the, the issue often in the past was, oh, the cities didn't have any money, they had all the problems, and the townships and the counties didn't want to deal with that. Now everybody's got money. So quite frankly, everybody's come to the table to put their chips on the table, and you've got real money behind it. So I think that is going to change the conversations from what they typically have done. Thank you. When do, uh, when should we start issuing out these funds? And how long do we have before we spend this first round of funds? When that money have to be spent? So you don't have to say it's your first and second round of money. All the money has to be spent in the next five years or so, uh, or at least encumbered and, and then spent. There's some rules about that. But you basically have several years. I wouldn't rush it out the door tomorrow. I, I think this is a great opportunity for the public to have input. I would. In a lot of communities, they are waiting until final rules are issued, which were, were promised at Labor Day, and that's come and gone. But I don't. I think it's going to be in the next few weeks, so I would wait at least for that to say, okay, we know now this can be done, this can't be done. You know, that way there's no problems. Um, but yeah, I would just take your time, get the public input. Um, you know, get the money out as soon as you can, obviously. But you know, yeah. I, I, but the first and second round tranches of money, there's really no, like, you have to spend the first round here. It's, it's all together, so So normally, well, normally, I can't say normally because it's the first time it's happened, but should this money be spent with, with probably with programs who we already have established or with new programs? And if you have a new program, how long do you have to present that program to the city before we can approve it to uh, go back out of the community to approve it? I mean, I think probably you want to do some of both because obviously if there's something you really want to do, now you got some money to do it, I would push on new programs. That said, existing programs are going to go faster. They're, you know, the old term shovel ready kind of thing. So, I mean, I think you, you probably want to do some of both, honestly. I would try and be a little more innovative. I do think, because I know talking to, like, Congressman Kelly and some others, they want to see some different things out there. They don't just want to see existing programs. So I do think if you can think a little outside the box, it's good. But, you know, obviously that's going to take more time for us. So I, I would kind of do some of both. Then, okay? um, as soon as the final rules are issued, I mean, I think a lot of communities will start spending money fairly quickly, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions. Any questions from the audience? I'm sorry, I had a few more questions. At this time, we're not taking questions from the audience, correct me? Correct. It is just up here. Correct. 
and so. Yeah, I, I'm happy to talk to people well, after this. Uh, I'll be around for a little while. I think. Um, yeah, I don't know, council number four. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz, um, uh, for the presentation. Go green. <laughs> uh, uh, it's real quick here. <clears throat> when we're looking at infrastructure spending and water and sewage replacement of lead lines, the governor has proposed two hundred million dollars for that in state. Are there other programs that we're looking at where some of these topics may be addressed at the state or federal level where we're not going to have to spend this money? Yeah, that's a great question. Since the politicians in Lansing are just trying to finalize the budget right now, and the state has five, almost six billion of this money itself, and we, I have talked to a number of state uh, agencies and directors about. Whatever you're doing at the state level, and how are you going to work with the locals? Because locals own most of the infrastructure, they do most of the service provision. I don't know, I wish I could say I got a better answer, to be honest with you. Um, but I, I do think you at least need to, you know, through MML or whoever, keep aware of what's going on in Lansing and try to see, okay, they've set up a program for this, so let's, which may be another reason to wait a little bit. I mean, the budget will be passed in the next two weeks, so. You know, let's see what the state does. Um, I'm sure Tim and others can give you information on what programs they're setting up so you don't duplicate or, you know, something like that with the state's doing. I, I wish I could tell you it's pretty secretive right now what they are going to do, but, I mean, they do have $5 billion of ARPA money. they still got CARES Act money. I mean, the state of Michigan has never had more money, honestly, ever. Like, right now, they just have incredible amounts of money. So I hope they will do some good things with them. And then also with this one-time infusion of money, but what we look at some of the communities that you cited, Providence, where they're having putting money into summer jobs, possibly paid internships, or year-round youth jobs with the uh, anti-violence. If that money is allocated in the first five years, but it spends past the first five, first five years, is that acceptable, or do we have to wait until the final? Uh, I mean, I would wait. Ultimately, you will have to encumber at least and probably actually spend the money within, I believe it's, I don't remember the exact date off the top of my head, but it's about five years. So within that time period, you will have to expend it the money out. But if we expend it to a nonprofit and give them a grant? Oh, they have to, yeah, I mean, probably they do too, yeah, I would think, yeah. But I don't know for sure we have to check that out. But I mean, it's a good question, yeah. Because obviously then you have to see, okay, what are they doing? How long are they taking? Right. So, and infrastructure projects could take several years. So, you know, you may have to look at at least encumbering money for those bigger projects because they may take a couple of years to do it. And so that there, I mean, again, I think U.S. Treasury is going to be very flexible. I mean, this is the president's plan. So obviously he's going to want to see it done. He isn't going to want to see things not happening or getting bogged down in bureaucracy. So, I mean, we do have the advantage of Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, you know, works for Biden. This is Biden's plan. It's one of his legacy pieces for sure. So, I mean, obviously they are going to try and be flexible and, and want communities to do things. They're not going to want, oh, you can't do that. You know, if you violate this technical rule, I mean, there are accountants and inspector generals who do that kind of stuff. But, but ultimately, they're going to try and they want you to do it. They want you to be successful. So, you know, this is not something where they're kind of against it. So, yeah. So, you know, we we'll, we'll have to factor that into what the written rules. Thank you. I have one last question. Say, human services and community development. Uh, I've been looking at consumer powers and the uh, city of Saginaw fixing uh, gas lines and water lines. And the racial disparity I see is, I don't see no, it don't look like the community working on those lines. And can we spend some of this money to equalize that to get people in our community to do those type of jobs too? I mean, because it just don't make sense to me to see the people driving in town work those jobs, get the money to drive back out of town, and the people living in the city is not getting any of that back. Yeah, I, I think, um, I don't know specifically about that. I guess I'd have to think about it. But absolutely, the law does emphasize throughout um, issues of racial disparities, equity, 
that the pandemic has hit some groups more than others. So absolutely, as far as you know, any of those kinds of equity issues, I don't know about that specific program, but I would say in general, they emphasize time and time again that you should be focused on those things. So for a community like this, absolutely, you need to look at it through the lens of racial equity or income equity or whatever you want to call it, uh, or all those things, uh, health equity, access to health services. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't answer your question about that specific thing, honestly, but but certainly we can talk more. But yeah, that's the kind of things this law is talking about. If I had to see programs that come to town and, and seem like all the money ended up getting made up for administration fees and only help, help and then how to help anybody. Yeah. You know, so I want to make sure that we spend these funds to help our, our community yeah. to improve the lives of our community so these kids don't have to go around doing the things they're doing right now. Yeah, and I think that's a good way to do that. $1 billion proposal in front of the legislature just for ARPA funds that has a host of programs. A lot of them are tied to workforce development, so there may be other pots of money and opportunities. To that end, too, I want to just emphasize something, and we've heard this a lot in other communities about you know school districts and what do, what do the local governments do there. Well, to give you some perspective, there's been $2.4 billion that's being awarded to local governments. So that's townships, cities, villages. There's 3.7 billion that's being awarded, again, just in ARPA dollars, to school districts. So the school districts are receiving substantial funds of money. So it's just important when you think about partnerships and working together and everybody figuring out kind of where their lane is to keep that in mind. Um, because obviously every organization has needs that exceed exceed the funding. And then the last piece is just the timing. Eric talked about that. It's important to understand the timing aspects. Um, you, know, you do have some time here. Obligated by the end of 2024, so December 31st, 2024, fully expended by the end of 2026. So December 31st, 2026 is when you have to have those dollars spent. Um, there is some question. I know it's a question about the revolving loan funds. You can do revolving loan funds. There's not clarity yet about extending dollars past that timeline with a program like that. Again, I think uh, Dr. Sposoni really hit the point about, you know, that final guidance is really going to be important on a lot of this. But then the other aspect is thinking about the time. You know, you do have some time here to sort things out. And, and this is an important process, right? Because today, you can start that process Start thinking big picture and understanding priorities, and then as you drill down over time, staff will obviously ensure that there's that documentation. But that public engagement and these types of processes are really important. They're going to be really helpful down the line. If the U.S. Treasury does come knocking, you can talk about these types of events and the things that you've done to be very strategic and thoughtful in the process. So, just a few few more points I wanted to add on to a very excellent uh, presentation. So I want to touch basically, uh, briefly, excuse me, on the community survey results. Um, this was an online survey that was open uh, to anyone uh, in the community. There were th a thousand responses, which is amazing to me that you actually ended with a, an even number and it being a thousand. Uh, 78.6 or 786 of those responses were within the city boundary. So by that definition, boundaries, um, of course, could be Residents in a lot of cases, you can kind of see the dots on the map, but it might be somebody who responded from a business that was within the city as well. So not to be interpreted solely as residents, but again, people that they took it from within the city, and about 21.4%, or 214, the map is actually, I didn't even do the map on this one, uh, it's pretty easy uh, to see, again, the majority being within the city. In terms of the priorities that the respondents Kind of selected or a, a menu of different options here the categories is laid out here 
Um, these are ranked by the largest uh, number of responses in terms of what they selected and as a top priority and then the percentage of those who made that particular category their top priority. The third um, column here, the importance ranking is a little bit separate. There was a scale from one to five, one being least important, five being very important, where they could also kind of qualify exactly how important they felt. So uh, the ranking itself doesn't necessarily have to align with that um, Likert scale number. In other words, it, it's sort of independent of that, but gives you another perspective on how important people thought any given element. Top one is crime and fire prevention. 25% of respondents noted that as their top issue. Housing and neighborhood revitalization was the second for 22% of the population, indicating that public infrastructure being the third one, 18%. And then from there, economic development opportunities, social programs, parks and trails, city beautification, healthcare access, others, and then we had a couple kind of unspecified, um, but there was only, only two of those. So you can kind of see how they, they rank. In terms of how important each one was, categorically, uh, public infrastructure got the highest at 4.2, and crime and fire prevention was just behind it at, at 4.1. So really, if this was a, a statistically analyzed survey, which it wouldn't because it wasn't truly random, um, that would be, I would say, statistically insignificant, right? That those are all identified, those top ones, are high priorities. The other categories kind of ranging from the low to mid threes to the upper threes in terms of that category. So that just gives you a, an initial kind of sense from the community at large what types of issues uh, they are looking at. And see what we're doing. Uh, unless there's questions, I'll move into the strategic planning process with everyone. Yes. After today, I know we're going to be planning our separate quadrant meetings. Will this survey be opening up again? We'll have to turn to the city manager for that. I don't know if we'll open the survey up again, but that'll be another opportunity where you could categorize some of those expenses and get input at that time. Um, you could leave the survey open all the time, but I think we did a, a lot of promotion with those neighborhood groups, and they're primarily the ones that are involved in the quadrants. And this is what we got. And as Tim said, it's not a scientific survey, so potentially you, you could just be getting repeated, uh, repeat responses, so you're likely to get the same thing. Um, other surveys I've seen are very similar to these results. I think. If you did it again, you'd probably get almost the same results. It's certainly when you look at the priorities, they align with a number of your key documents, whether it's the master plan, the consolidated plan. You're seeing a lot of overlap here. Thank you very much. Um, are, are there any regards to the survey? It's online survey, but am I mistaken? That there were also paper surveys available, so are those included in um, the survey responses? Yes, there, there were paper surveys available and they were coded uh, and included in all the results. Okay, and um, also when you get down to uh, others and unspecified, can that be elaborated on? Because I would be interested in what all the citizens uh, had to say. So. When it says other and unspecified, I have no idea what my community wants if it doesn't say it. Sure, yeah, those were categories that were identified that did not fit into one of the buckets that somebody just listed. So I'm sure we could probably provide that information to identify those. I don't know what those are off the top of my head. That would be helpful. Thank you so very much. We do have that data. Um, um, even the comments, we have that raw data. Um, in this summary that, that uh, Mr. Dempsey put together, these are the, the resident identified city address responses. And right now, in the others and unspecified, there's only seven responses. So we can even get you that, those comments sometime after the meeting. In, in addition to even the ones that fell into an existing category, there was a number, there's a, you know, comments to, to many of them because it was a question. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that raw data would present that information. I have one other question for so I see. When I look at the map in regards to the responses, and I see the cluster over to the left. Uh, have we tried to figure out why it was so less responsive? Um, did they have internet? Did they have the wherewithal to respond or even know about the survey? Because I'm looking at it and it looks no good to me. I'm going to look to the city staff to talk about how it was promoted. And yeah, we promoted it the best that we could. Again, it's, it's not a scientific survey. It's open to everyone, anyone that can come to City Hall. And I know several council members took it out to the public and handed it out. So you know, all we can say is it was open. But um, when you do these other input meetings, obviously there'll be whether you want to do it with quadrants or directly with neighborhood associations, however you want to do it, you'll have a chance to get out there and get that additional information uh, by whatever means you think you want to proceed. Okay. Can we put that slide back up so everyone knows what Council was referring to, the cluster the graph? We can't read that. No, it's not, not about, she was referring to the uh, the amount of people that surveyed on the west versus the east. Yeah. And just wanted everyone to be able to, I don't think everyone has the same version. Right. All right, well, you're welcome. Thank you for the questions. So we're going to move on to the strategic plan. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we going to be able to obtain the raw data, or would that be for the public, or would we have to request it from the Johnson? Well, most of it is, most of the data is in the categories. If you took the survey, you ranked the category. So we have that, and then beyond that, there's, I think, a thousand, probably a thousand different comments that are in there. So we can put something together if you want to either come in and, and have a meet about that, or if you want us to just provide that and follow up data to the meeting, you can do that too. Was there any other data on the 21.4% of the folks outside of the city that have uh, taken the survey of what their priorities were for crime? Yes. Crime? Yeah, there was, there was data there. Um, in terms of ranking, the, the top three categories were ranked the same way. So crime, fire prevention one, housing two, and then uh, public infrastructure three. And then after that, um, there were some differences in terms of social programs, economic development, um, city beautification, but, but not significant. Uh, the categories moved a little bit, but nothing that, that stood out as a significant difference. And although it wasn't scientific, was it listed the same way that it's listed here, or was it randomly uh, printed out where people would be filling out the survey where the, categor the categories were randomly listed? I think the survey was the same for everyone. So if you did it online, you had one screen pop up and it had this topic, housing or neighborhood localization, whichever it was. You ranked it and um, on that scale, and that was the same for everybody. I don't think we programmed it to be different in a different order, and obviously the paper ones were all the same as well. And because it's not scientific and the, the turnout was so low, are we going to be using this to guide uh, our decision making on our club, or is this all the best we got? Kind of thing? I think this is, you, you're going to have a lot of factors because obviously council members aren't going to go talk to 45,000 people. Right? So you have to make your decision based on the data and information that you have. And, and also, what are the rules for the grant spending? So, this is just a tool. I think some council members wanted information in this manner, so this is what we put together. Um, you're going to have additional meetings where people uh, talk to you about what they're interested in or, or brainstorm. You're, um, I'm sure you've already been contacted by several people or organizations that have ideas, so I think you're going to have a lot of input from a lot of different areas that have to take into consideration when you're making decisions or making plans. Uh, just a quick question. And goes back to what Councilman uh, Copeland was talking about. 
as we go into the different quadrants, I think that particular slide is important to take in with the results on it so that we can get some feedback from our residents that maybe didn't have the opportunity to take the survey and see if their thought process actually aligns with what you're looking at. So that's kind of where my head is on that, especially with um, Councilwoman Sylvia, which was talking about the response and the dots. So, I'm sure I'll get some responses on that. Well, as the city manager indicated and worked with the communities that were helping across the state, you know, surveys are just, again, one tool. And this, I think, is just an early indication of kind of a broader categories. Other engagement, other feedback, obviously, is really important. It's all part of the life.